Hi there, everybody. Thank you for joining us all today. Um, so just before we get started um, on this session, um, I just thought I'll do a little bit of an introduction um, because obviously you won't know who I am and you're probably wondering who, who I am and what you know what gives me the right to do the session today. Um, so my name is Chloe Rhodes. I'm the National Compliance Manager for CRISP um, and I sort of specialise in the education sector. Um, so I've sort of worked in education for just over 10 years um covering for, um, estates facilities and health and safety um in both private sector and also mainstream um but crisp as a business we currently support over 120 schools uh, nationwide as well um and that's for a variety of health and safety needs um so just general health and safety auditing uh, fire risk assessments documentation support uh, and other things as well and then in addition to that, we also have a digital compliance system that helps uh, businesses to track and manage their compliance paperwork. So we, it's a bit of a dual business, um, but we help lots of people with their health and safety needs. And obviously one of those issues that we support schools with is security. Um, and I think in, in more recent months, uh, this has become a much more prevalent uh, topic, um, something that's coming up and something that I suspect that we'll start to see some changes in guidance to in the coming months, uh, given events that have happened recently. Um, so hopefully today's session will just give you a little bit of insight, a little bit more advice and guidance on what you need to do to have a secure site and also what you need to do as a, as a leader in your school. Uh, so can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so what we're going to cover today is just a breakdown of managing your security at your school, how we can achieve it. Um, a lot of what we're going to discuss, you, you will most likely already have in place. Um, you might be doing it or you might be looking at ways that you can improve it um, and how to make your site as secure as you possibly can. But we'll break it down. Um, so we're going to look at preparation um and plans and how we put it all into practice um so hopefully the session will be about 30 minutes 45 minutes um but as uh, as we've said there's a it will answer some questions towards the end uh next slide please and, and just before we get into it, it is just worth mentioning as well that incidents in schools are rare in the UK. Um, there isn't any readily available statistics for this uh, at the moment, and the possibly that might never be released. But it is very, very rare. Um, and not all breaches of security on schools are under suspicious circumstances. They can happen for lots of reasons, um, some which I'll discuss later on in this session. Um, but it is just worth reminding people that not everything is, is, is always sinister. OK, next slide, please. So just like we teach the children, uh, the key to any successful task is, is preparation. Um, so what do we need to start with to make sure that we are prepared? And one of the first areas we need to take a look at is, is the people that we've got, the people around us in our team. And um, just they're the ones that are going to help us make keep our site as secure as possible. And one of the first things that we could do is, is to nominate some staff within the team into leader roles. So this might be something you do already. And what you would do is you would have a staff leader and then you would have an incident leader. These people, uh, it could be you, yourself, it could be a head teacher, your deputy assistant head, or it could be um, a member of your SLT team. Next slide. So your staff leader or your security lead, as it's sometimes known in, in guidance, um, as I say, this could be a teacher, deputy, member of your SLT. But this person, they're going to have the overall responsibility of security and, and prep, essentially. And part of this role is you want to be looking at developing and updating and reviewing any policies or risk assessments that you've got in place, such as your lockdown plans, security plans, and procedures that you've got. Um, being in the role that you are currently, you'll have a good insight into your into your staff, um, their strengths and their weaknesses. So think carefully about who you may want to, want in sort of particular roles. Um, so, for example, you might have a member of staff who's a, a real quick thinker, someone who's really calm and can lead in a stressful situation. 
and then you might have someone else who commands and communicates exceptionally well with the children and who could lead calmly and firmly in an emergency situation and you also want to ensure that all your staff are aware of their roles and responsibilities in the situation and if the lead is absent who's going to take over that role who's going to be the person to step up in that role and are they trained and qualified enough to do that role next slide please and then following on from your staff lead you can nominate an incident lead now this is the person that's going to lead that initial response in an emergency situation so they'll liaise with the police or other authorities that may be involved and again they're going to be someone who can make quick clear decisions under pressure they'll also manage communication to parents guardians and any media communications as well so if you've got any news outlets um sort of coming to coming to you they'll be the sort of person that can approach that situation calmly and do things the right way it is worth mentioning at this point as well that if you don't have a media policy in place make sure that you implement one um, because this is going to outline what you will do in that situation um, and what you can and cannot say um, if you're part of a multi-academy trust the chances are that there's a trust-wide policy in place for, for media communication. Um, if you're a maintained school, so if you're still with the local authority, the local authority will most likely have a media policy too. So just make sure that you are clear with that policy and that you do know what it is that you can say in those situations. Um, some schools will actually have a little script that they keep up in the office um, on a notice board. And that can be really helpful if they if you've got um, your admin or your business manager taking calls. They've got that script there and they know what they can and cannot say to those people. Next slide, please. So we've got your staff lead, we've got your incident lead, and then we've got the rest of your team. So the rest of your staff, what do we expect from them? What do we want those staff to do? So first thing is, any training that we might be giving staff we want them to complete their training which sometimes is is hard work um you're all tight for time and it, it can sometimes be really really difficult but the more training that they can do the better so make sure that any training relating to security make sure that's all up to date generally speaking training is usually refreshed every three years um and it's you know it's really really important to keep on top of it purely because guidance and advice changes quite frequently. So if you're doing that training regularly, you are keeping up with what's whatever changes have, have happened within that time frame. We also, what we want from everybody is to be vigilant. We want everyone to stay vigilant. Keep a lookout, what's happening around the school, what's happening in the school. And if they see anything that they think might be suspicious, have that open door policy and ask them to report it, even if it amounts to nothing let's just let's just say to our staff no we'd rather you come forward and tell us if you think or you feel something's not quite right remind them to ask questions if they see something that they that they don't think is right if they see someone that they don't know ask to you know ask them to approach that person and say hello ask if they can help if they feel safe to do so um i i'm in schools day in day out every week and sadly i still do have situations where I go into a school, I'm not asked for my DBS, I sometimes don't get given a lanyard or I don't get given a badge and I'll go into the school, I'll start doing whatever it is that I'm doing and then the person that's walking around with me might need to kind of pop off or go and talk to somebody and I'm left stood there on my own and very rarely am I approached by a member of staff to ask who are you, what are you doing? So it's really really important that people ask that and, and for me you know it's great if somebody comes up to me and asks me what i'm doing i'm like that's that's fantastic that's that's what we should be doing so just be really really mindful um, of that and what what are your staff doing um in addition to that we want them to be really familiar so any plans that you put in place any procedures we want them to be familiar with that and understand what that means for them um if that means sharing in staff meetings twilight sessions whatever it is that you do make sure that they've got access to those documents in addition to that 
We also want to consider um, our SEN pupils as well. Um, so who is best uh, dealing with those children, any vulnerable children that we've got? Um, who can who's best placed to be in that situation to support those children in emergency situations and also not forgetting your site team so your caretakers site manager premises manager whatever they might be called get them involved where you can as well so i know it can be difficult depending on whether they're employed in house or if they're an external contractor but it's really important that they're considered part of the team and that they are involved with with this uh with staff security and site security. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that with training, there are a number of modules, as you will probably all very well know, um, and there's lots of different training that you can do based on site security. Um, the ones I've put on this slide here, uh, some of the, the ones that stand out more. So we've got the scan training, which is on the government website. Um, see check and notify um i watched that uh, a bit ago and i i it was quite a, it was a bit of an eye opener i thought um in terms of um videos it was interesting to see the perspective that they put on that and how we perceive people and what it is that they do and their behavior so that's a really interesting video to watch you've obviously got prevent training there lockdown training which is essentially we're going to be covering a little bit of that today and fire as well fire training is very very important because that can sometimes interlink with security situations um you might be enrolled already with um like training licenses such as national college um twinkle offer a lot of sessions um so it's good to have a look at what's available to you and, and how staff can access that but there are lots and lots of modules out there that that you can use uh, in terms of security training uh, next slide so we're talking about um cctv um i've recently done a q a video for twinkles resource library um where we talk about the subject of cctv and that should be available for you to, to have a look at later if you want to but cctv is a really really great deterrent when it comes to site security um you may already have CCTV on your premises, um, whether that's an old system or a fairly new system. Um, but what does that look like currently? What areas does that cover? So do you just have the one single camera? Do you have a couple? Um, it's good to kind of have a look at that overall and, and see what coverage have you got? Does it does it give you a wide view of, of the areas you've got outside, uh, you know, outside your premises? Um, You've got to remember with CCTV, um, I think some people seem to think that we can just install CCTV, um, but it's it's really, really important to remember that you do need to consider very, very carefully when you're having it fitted. So depending on where you are, uh, where your school is, uh, so say for example, you're in quite a, a dense neighborhood, um, again, you've got to be very careful that your CCTV doesn't overlook people's gardens, people's properties, um but we want to make sure that we're covering as much of our premises as possible so the key areas are obviously they're going to be your main entrances your gates um any blind spots that you might have as well um waste bin areas um and the reason we say that is because uh, waste bins can be used for a couple of reasons they can be used to be pushed up against the building to climb onto to get onto a roof or to get further into your premises but they can also be used opened up um, and set fire to um, it's it's one of the, the major causes of arson especially for schools so having cctv footage around those areas can be really really useful um, if you can if you can get further into internal areas, that's great. Um, obviously, CCTV is not uh, cheap to do, um, but if the more you can have, obviously, the better it would be. Um, where they're fitted, you obviously want them in a position where they can't be tampered with. So we want them fairly high up, but in an area where they can't be accessed. So away from a wall, away from your bins, um, just away from anything that someone could climb onto to cover them up or damage them. 
In addition to that, we want some signage as well. So we need to warn people that we are recording them, a bit like we've done today with this session. We need to let people know that they are being recorded. Um, but it's great for somebody that might want to come onto your site and cause a little bit of drama. They know that we are recording them and that there is footage there. In addition to that, if you have external lighting, particularly sensor lighting, it works really, really well. Sometimes even if you don't have the CCTV, sensor lighting is fantastic because the minute that lighting comes on, if you've got somebody coming onto your premises that shouldn't be there, that can really, really put them off because it, it's just, the light is so bright. If you're in a neighborhood again, people can see what's going on on your premises. So the two working together, CCTV and lighting is fantastic. Um, when you've got your CCTV in place, what you then want to do is you need to have a CCTV policy. And what this policy will do is basically outline how you intend to use the cameras and who's going to be using it, who's going to be accessing it. Now, access to it, it's got to be limited. We can't have everybody looking at it. We can only have limited people accessing the footage and looking at the footage. In addition to that, any monitors you've got in the school for the CCTV must be locked away as well, um, ideally in a room or a cupboard where it can only be accessed by yourself or a couple of other nominated people. Those people who do look at it, they should be named within that policy. They need to sign that policy. And if any member of staff leaves that is on the policy, that needs to be changed as well and updated regularly. Uh, next slide, please. And then we go on to your basic security measure measures as well. So um, these are things that you may just overlook because everybody in a school is so busy doing their day to day jobs and looking after the children and teaching. Some of these things do get missed and it's really, really easy. Um, so things like your start and your end of day procedures. Do you have that documented? Do you have a clear start and end of day procedure in place? Now, that might be mostly for your caretaker or yourself or whoever the first person is that comes onto your premises. Locking doors and windows and gates. So who does that? whose responsibility does that belong to if you've got staff that may loan work do you have a loan worker policy and does it state in that policy that it's their responsibility to lock the doors lock the windows and check the gates before they leave it's really really important that everybody does that and sometimes i think we can get into the habit of if we're working late and we've got cleaners in and we've got the caretaker in it's easy to leave those doors and windows open because we might think well Somebody else will do it. Someone else is going to come in and do it for us. But that's not always the case. So when you leave, close the door behind you, lock it up, lock your windows, close the windows, close the curtains if you need to. And then you can leave as well. In addition to that, if you've got contractors on your site, who's checking up on those contractors and the work that they're doing? Um, so I've experienced a situation in a school before where a contractor was working on a roof and um, he left at the end of the day, left about four o'clock, but he left all his equipment. So he left his ladders, he left all his tools, everything, and it was all on the roof. Later that night, a group of teenagers got onto the premises, went up the ladders onto the roof and started a fire, which then spread down to the side of the building. Now, very thankfully, there was a retired fireman that lived nearby. He smelt the smoke. He looked out of his window, saw the fire on the school and called 999. And they were able to come out really quickly and get rid of the fire. There was some damage uh, to a outside of a classroom, to a window and a door. But what it meant was that the next day, it was safe for the children to come into school and for the staff to come into school and carry about their day as normal. But it just highlights that it isn't just our staff that can sometimes cause the problems. It can also be your contractors. What are they doing? Where is Where are their belongings? Are they tidying up properly after they've left? Um, we just mentioned again, loan working. 
obviously if we do have people in on their own make sure that you've got a really robust loan working risk assessment in place for them and that it's substantial and it's effective for what it is that they're doing obviously we don't want people in the buildings really late we don't want to be putting people at risk so just make sure that your risk assessment you've got co covers all those issues um in addition to that you know inevitably as a school you're going to be having events so parents evenings performances school fairs whatever it is security still needs to be monitored to ensure that we have the right people entering the building so this could be managed by an appointment system a ticket system um, and monitoring entry points as well so we obviously we don't want all the doors unlocked ideally you just want one point of entry um, in addition to that you want to limit how far visitors can actually enter your premises we don't want them wandering around the corridors or going into classrooms or cupboards or other rooms so if you've got the the you know if you've got the privilege of being able to close and lock down double doors corridor doors make sure you, that you do that to make sure to stop people wandering further into the school building okay next slide so we then move on to the planning stage we've done some preparation and now we're going to move on to the planning stage so how can we create plans to make sure that we've got a secure site so again you might be doing this already but one really useful tool and not everybody does this is making connections with local groups so that could be the parish council community groups the local police fire or any other authorities that you have in your community and what they'll, they'll be able to do is they can give you information and discuss any issues that are going on in your area and that in turn will then help you to know what's going on um, just very recently um, i spoke to a head teacher who attends parish council meetings they're an executive head they look after three different schools which are all in different areas they attend the council meetings and the information that they get from that is, is priceless because they get to hear about what's going on and they can prepare just a little bit more uh, than what you might do normally. So they're really, really useful groups to go to if you have the time. Um, now, this could be done by yourself. It could be done by your incident lead or even if you've got another staff member who you think would be helpful to attend those meetings, um, a governor, anybody. Um, it's just a really, really useful thing to, to be able to do. And if you are school site that has maybe another building on your premises so for example a nursery or a community center or a show start center something like that um do you have regular meetings with those people do you have regular communication on health and safety issues because there might be sort of vital pieces of information that they can share with you and you can share with them to, to keep both of you safe and secure but as i said don't this doesn't obviously need to be done just by one person. This this can be a task that can be shared with other people. Ask your governors to get involved. See if they'll join the meetings. See if they can pull on their resources and their connections as well. Um, any information that you come across, you know, use it wisely and where appropriate, you know, share it, share it with your team. Next slide, please. So your plans do you have an emergency response plan in place already so it might not be called an emergency response plan it could be called a critical incident plan or a business continuity plan or some something similar but i'm sure you probably will have one already now hopefully it is in place it is up to date and you've reviewed it fairly recently and what this document is going to do it's going to outline your intentions in the event of emergency so it will include staff roles and responsibilities it will include important contact details and it'll have a breakdown of all of your procedures for various situations so for example fire uh, lockdown floods asbestos outbreaks damage to the building gas leaks there'll be lots of different scenarios that this plan will will cover you for 
and make sure that that documentation is shared across your team so it's great that we've got that plan in place but actually have your staff members read that plan would they know what to do in those situations and once it is in place where do you keep your plan so is it in a file somewhere in the staff room is it on teams on a teams channel is it in a shared file where is it and do all of your staff know where to find that document it's also good as well it's good to kind of um to have a copy of this document elsewhere so if there is an incident that happens out of hours for example you can get access to that document um so if you're not cloud based and you can't access this when you've gone home you know it it might be useful to just have a copy in the back of your car and then you can get that fairly easily and you've got all the inform information there that you need next slide please so once your plan is in place you need to talk about it um one of the rules that i always share with people is um any risk assessments any procedures and policies that you put in place always speak to your staff about it because they can give, um, you know, you might have staff that live locally in the community and they might have a better understanding of the area of where your school is. And they'll be able to share their own thoughts and ideas about what it is that you're doing, because it might be something that they do every day and they can offer a slightly different insight. So it's really, really useful to talk to your team. Um, it's always good practice as well, as particularly with risk assessments, to ask what it is that they do. What's what's their what kind of what things do they come across? So, for example, when they're doing a fire drill with the children, are there any is there certain children that struggle with that with doing a drill? Is there any children that don't particularly understand it or that cause some issues? in those situations they can really help you to write those policies and those risk assessments because you they can consider other situations and other people that you might not be come across every single day in your role and the next slide so in the event of an intruder entering your building or security breach you need to consider how your staff are going to be notified so do you have a specific lockdown alarm fitted you might already you might not they're very very expensive to fit so there's not many schools that can, that can get them unfortunately so in that situation how do you raise the alarm so you might be using your current fire alarm or your school bell if you have one some systems allow you to change the tone um so if you can do that, that's fantastic, because what we don't want is we don't want our fire drill and our lockdown drill to be exactly the same. We want them to sound different so that people can differentiate the threat. Um, if you don't have either of those options, so you've got no kind of sounding system, we need to consider other ways of, of communicating with staff quickly. So it could be done with a tannoy system if you have that um using a code word because what we don't want to do is panic and worry visitors or children we just want to be able to calmly get across in a message on a tannoy system what's going on um if you use radios that can be really helpful but obviously only if everybody has one or if every classroom has one instant messaging on internal phone systems or computer systems providing that staff can pick that message up quickly or doing a group message to staff um, on their personal devices but again could you guarantee that they're going to receive that message would they have their phone handy at the time we also need to consider your other staff that you would have in the school so any volunteers any agency staff um caterers cleaners your caretakers again can everybody get the message that potentially we do have an intruder on the premises and that we might need to go into a lockdown. Um, in addition to that, there'll be items that you will need to access in a lockdown. So you'll probably already have this for your fire drills, but a grab bag. So we'll need a grab bag because if anybody gets injured, if we have anybody tripping over, um, you might have children with that are on medications. Um, so we need to have some sort of grab bag there available 
for those rooms. We also need a method of communicating as well without noise. So that could be a notepad, it could be a small whiteboard, anything that can be written on. So for the teacher, for example, to communicate with children or for anybody else that they need to communicate with quietly. Next slide, please. So you've got your team in place. They've completed training. You've created a plan. You've worked on your site security. And all that's really left to do is to practice. So if your alarm or your bell system doesn't allow for this, um, we obviously we're going to use the Tannoy system. We're going to use um, we're going to use a phone system. Whatever other plan you came up with, we need to put that now into a practice. Now, it can sometimes, I, I do speak to head teachers quite a lot. And one of the things that they always say to me is, oh, I haven't done a lockdown yet because it just, it stresses me out or I'm really worried about doing it or I don't think this person's going to react very well to it. This is the whole point of doing a practice is that the chances are, it's not going to go right the first time and that's okay this is exactly why we do it we learn from it and then we move on and we do it again and we get better so it's perfectly fine to be apprehensive about it but the main thing is is that we just try it and see how we get on so what if we just move to the next slide sorry um so i think if you have done one already fantastic that's brilliant um guidance is is that you complete a lockdown drill at least once a year um i go into schools that do them termly uh with their fire with their fire drills that's okay as well um i think you would need to make that decision based on your setting because it is different for everybody um, and there are lots of things to consider uh, when we do a lockdown drill as well so the first thing we're going to do before we dive into it is we're just going to talk to our team about it um, we're going to sit down with everybody and we're going to talk about doing this lockdown drill. And again, that just gives our staff to kind of hold their hand up and say, OK, that's fine. But I think this pupil might might have a problem with it and this pupil might not react very well to it. And we can implement that and we can put that into our plan and our procedure. In addition to that, we want to let our parents know, our parents and our guardians. Um, I have unfortunately seen and heard many situations where parents haven't been informed and they haven't been notified uh, that the school was going to do a lockdown drill. And then there's been absolute uproar when the children have gone home. Um, I've seen quite a few videos on TikTok recently, actually, where um, just before the summer holidays, where parents were just having a general rant. Uh, on TikTok about the fact that their child had done a lockdown drill and then they come home and then of course in true five or six year old fashion they've they've elaborated the story or they've changed the story somewhat and, and mum and dad are, are, are quite understandably a bit upset so it's really really good to just to let them know and it gives them the opportunity to obviously have that chat with their children as well uh, about that situation um, again it is just worth reiterating that lockdown isn't just for sinister reasons. It's not just about a big bad person coming onto the school. It's It can be done for lots and lots of other reasons. Um, we want to consider doing an assembly with the children um, or a class-based session, again, about the drill, what we're going to be doing, why we're going to be doing it, and just reiterating those kind of safety uh, conversations that you would normally have with the children. Um, so some of it they will already be aware of, but it is just good just to let them know and just to give them a little bit of a warning as well. Again, we want to consider our SEN pupils, our vulnerable pupils, um, you know, children with, <coughs> sorry, with um, sensory needs. If there's going to be an alarm, what is their response to that alarm? Um, do, they, do they normally freeze? Do they run? Um, what what's what what's their response in that situation and how are you going to be able to help that pupil um i've just recently i've started to come across a few situations where um schools that have taken in uh refugee children from ukraine um we've had situations where when the fire alarm has been sounding the children have run and hid under tables and that's because that's what they were taught uh, sadly 
um, that when they heard that alarm, they had to take shelter. And that's what they did because it wasn't really explained to them. So if you do have any children who have maybe come from these countries, it's really, really important to have those conversations with parents separately um, and just to make sure that they're aware of what you're doing, but that also that the child's prepared for that and there's support in place as well for them. Um, and if we could just go to the next slide. So you'll all probably know this already. Um, when we do a drill, this is essentially what we're going to do. So if we are outside, if we're on a break, um, we want to get into the building quickly. And as soon as we're in the building, we want to close and lock all the doors and all the windows. We're going to close any blinds and any curtains that we might have. Anyone that's going into a classroom, if they've got the ability to lock their classroom door, fantastic. If not, they want to be pushing up furniture against those doors. We want to turn off any lights, and that includes any devices as well. So if there's any computers in there, if they've got the time, turn off the computers, turn off any mobile phones. We want to keep away from windows or any areas where you're visible. Make sure your mobile devices are on silent. And don't move position or leave the room that you're in. Stay where you are and keep the children where they are as well. Use those, use those notepads, use those whiteboards to communicate with the children, to tell them what you need to do. And then we're just going to await a further instruction. Don't leave the room that you're in until you've been told to do so by someone who you feel is the right person. So if it's a drill, there'll be a head teacher or whoever's leading that situation. And we also just need to remember the run, hide, tell message as well, which is very self-explanatory. We want to run away, we need to hide, and then we need to tell the enforcement authorities what we've seen and what we've heard. Okay. Um, again, going back to those scenarios, um, just a couple of kind of non-threatening scenarios, I suppose, that I've come across. Um, and again, which is ones that some schools do tell tell their pupils um i've had a situation before at a school where a uh, fairly rural school um i've had somewhere they've had livestock get onto their school playground um so they've had to bring the children in we've had a situation where um a stag has been hit by a car and then the stag has run into the school field at break time um pretty mad about the fact that he'd been hit by a car um and then as a result of that, they've had to get the children into the school really, really quickly. Um, and then we've had a situation where there's been a fire locally and because of the smoke, again, we've needed to get everybody inside the building. So it isn't just always very sinister reasons. Obviously we have to be very mindful of security, but there are lots of other reasons why we would need to practice and, and do these things. And next slide, please. <coughs> So if your first lockdown goes without any hiccups, then a huge well done to you. But the chances are that is that you will probably need to do it again. And that's perfectly OK. That's that's not a problem at all. And, this, and again, as I said, this is why we do what we do. So go through your notes. Um, what did we pick up on when we did the drill? Did we have any rooms that weren't locked? Any windows that were open? Curtains that were open? any noise what were the things that you noticed get that message across to the staff and if you need to change your processes change what it is that you're doing so that it works better the next time and then once you've done that try again and just keep doing it until you feel confident and happy with with that process and with that procedure um again just keep that communication open with everybody with your staff with your pupils with your parents but there's no harm in, in doing this practice again and again until you feel like you've you've got it right when you have got it right or if you are getting it right already then a bit like you would do with a fire drill let's mix it up a little bit let's change what it is that we're doing so can we block a route can we block an exit let's get staff thinking right what can we do next time what do we need to change and that will help the situation because a bit like a fire drill in that real-time situation 
something will be different it isn't going to be the same every single time so it's good to just change things and get people thinking <laughs>